Um, so this is a somber day of reflection and honoring those who have lost their lives at the intersections of class, race, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, sex work, disability, religion, culture, region, and hate. A reflection on what it is that makes our Latin and black sisters across Latin and South America so particularly vulnerable to trans violence a reflection on the disproportionate burden of violence all black trans people face here in America, a somber but serious discussion on gendered violence, and how white supremacy, classism, patriarchy, and our cultural disdain for sex workers and women creates an environment that is killing our sisters and imposing a culture of fear. That was my first thought when someone asked me what the Transgender Day of Remembrance was. <laughs> but the truth is, it's none of those things. <laughs> the truth is that the Transgender Day of Remembrance is a day of political grandstanding, using the deaths of trans women of color as a numbers game to buy someone else's pet project, sympathy votes, dollars, or attention. It was wholly owned, it's a wholly owned copyright of a single individual. You heard me right? Owned who at least in reference to this event has been too silent on the impact of race, class, disability, and sex work in the violence we so readily use as leverage to pass ENDA or get top surgery. Frankly, none of those things should be an afterthought. They should be the things that we lead in with. But with our dominant narrative as innocent witnesses to transphobic hate crimes, rather than allowing ourselves the necessity of destabilizing and complicating that narrative to what it means to be a victim of violence in our community, we can't. With transphobia as our sole and singular axis by which violence, and thereby membership of the trans community, is recognized and validated, we implicitly erase other markers and labels while forcing labels individuals may never have asked for. Effectively deracializing and decontextualizing violence from broader trends and impacts. To put it another way, if our community spent half the amount of time talking about race as it did criticizing trans men or saying T doors about trans women, it may well be on our way to finding solutions and making radical change. I'm not saying that those things aren't worth our time. But does it mean to have a serious and continuing conversation on race, class, disability, and sex work or not? And we have to ask ourselves why it is we prioritize some conversations and deprioritize others. Why do we interject and prioritize a narrative of transphobia in the deaths of individuals? The folks behind broader TDOR narratives have said in no uncertain terms. Not every person, this is a quote, not every person representing, represented during the Transgender Day of Remembrance self-identified as transgender. That is, as a transsexual, cross-dresser, or otherwise gender variant. But each was a victim of violence based on bias against transgender people. Indeed, according to their analysis of the state of violence and bias against transgender people, indeed, according... Uh, in 2006, on their own website, over the last decade, more than one person a month has died due to transgender-based hate and injustice, regard regardless of any other facts in their lives. So I think they make it clear that it wasn't an accident, that it is by design that transphobia is isolated as the sole factor by which we are to witness and analyze these atrocities. Sarah Lamble writes so much more clearly about this than I could ever do in uh, retelling racialized violence, remaking white innocence, in the politics of interlocking oppressions in Transgender Day of Remembrance. She wrote, by focusing on transphobia as the definitive cause of violence, we do not fully contextualize incidents of violence within their specific time and place. Thus observing the ways in which hierarchies, race, class, sexuality, situate and constitute as acts, 
In the process, transgender bodies are universalized along a singular identity plane of victimhood and rendered visible primarily through the violence that is acted upon them. As an aside to that, uh, I've certainly heard people validate their transness via their experiences with violence. But, but Trans Day, it's a, it's a day where trans women of color have greater value dead than we do alive. It, it, it's hard not to hear the call of Mira Soler Ross, who denounced the whole day as a big, bold, sickening political fraud. We all too often hear that this day is a day that we must not let the deaths of these women be in vain, but this just underscores the transactional nature of these women's deaths most of whom fought no war. They lost their lives not in valor, but only as a result of being women in a world filled with gendered violence. They lost their lives because, all too often, our society cast out the disenfranchised and marginalized and no longer calling the huddled masses and tempest-tossed. We, we should gather to mourn the dead not to conscript them into a battle they never had the privilege to fight while living. It pains me to stand here and remind you that these deaths of our brothers and sisters, yes, I said brothers, that these deaths are senseless tragedies that remain a black mark on society. These deaths are signs of the systemic tragedies that are institutional, social, economic, political, and they represent our failure for our most vulnerable and marginalized populations. But what may be worse is the crude politicizing of these deaths serves no cause more than that of the same vanity we decry. And in fact, in many ways, serves to reinforce and reestablish the same social hierarchies and systems that facilitate the means by which dominance is asserted via violence. My presence on stage and my living in a body with pale skin should serve as that stark reminder. The reading of each mispronounced name that usually happens, mostly from extracontinental locations, acts as a drop of emotional currency for the pimps feeding the masses hungry for misery pornography and serve validation upon their fears. I, I want to be clear that all fear is real. And I sympathize deeply with the way that events like this, the general climate of fear, non-lethal violence, and broader aspects of discrimination felt by our community can impact our lives in real ways, regardless of whether or not our risks truly match. But if we are to move forward in creating the change, if we are to move forward in ending the lethal, non-lethal, discursive, institutional, and cultural violence that plagues our society, if we're to forge a future where trans women of color's lives are cherished and we don't find reason to feel that we must look over our shoulders every waking moment, then we have to be willing to have a real discussion about the violence that faces our community. Why and what factors affect our risk? This isn't in order to commit a relative privatization, but instead step back from the real emotional reaction from the climate and to look at the why. It's become really, really in vogue in the so-called radical queer and trans communities to spend a lot of breath criticizing trans men uh, for co-opting movements of violence. And in some spaces, there have come similar criticisms to white trans women. And I, and, and I really do think that such criticisms have their fair place at deconstructing some of the extreme colonization that happens. But I think they fail and they fall short in telling the broader story about why trans women of color, especially black trans women, are so frequently shouldering the burden of lethal violence. Here's what it comes down to it for me. Intimate partner violence. I promise I'll clarify later why this helps us understand lethal violence and why it disproportionately affects black trans women. It may reveal itself, but I, I, I would ask that you please bear with me. 
all trans people, from genderqueer to trans women to trans men to gender non-conforming to cross-dresser, we all face horrifying levels of intimate partner violence and domestic violence. With the broader trans population facing twice or more the rates of the general population. In preparing my comments tonight, I spent quite a lot of time uh, staring at statistics and at numbers and collected by various organizations and working to break down that information to help us better understand this stuff. I felt like I was going back to those statistics lessons my adopted father put me through. So, full disclosure. Data collection in regards to anti-trans violence is awful. Uh, hell, trans anything, it's pretty bad. Especially for lethal violence and non-lethal violence. Data collection tends to rely a lot on self-reporting. Um, and as you all know, you can't self-report if you're dead. Um, so it's really hard to track and interpret that data. But I was able to track down enough numbers to begin getting a general idea. And it matches kind of what we would expect. And it's, it starts to paint a picture of the world all of us live in, and why that burden is so disproportionately distributed towards black trans women and trans Latinas. So uh, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force Injustice at Every Turn, National Transgender <coughs> Discrimination Survey, Voices Unheard, Domestic Abuse, LGBT Young People's Perspectives, Gender Violence, Transgender Experiences with Violence and Discrimination, the CDC's National Intimate Partner Violence Survey, Private Lives, a report on the health and well-being of the GLBTI individuals, Action Mutual, Transgender Latinas and HIV, and the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, LGBT and HIV-affected Intimate Partner Violence in 2012 report were all instrumental in what limited data I was able to come to. For the sake of the audience's attention spans, I'll refrain from citing every, though I will a few, instance I use numbers and quotes, but I'll be happy to add sort of specifics later during the Q&A. Um, so that's the reason why I kind of walk you through exactly what I was referencing. We all know that one in four statistic on domestic violence. I presume we all know the one in four statistic um, against women, right? One in four women experience domestic violence or intimate partner violence in their lives. And for trans women, that statistic grows and grows to a frightening three in five. The broader research shows that domestic and intimate partner violence faced by trans women is at a rate of 60%, and with trans men facing such violence at 50% higher than their cis counterparts. Additionally, these numbers come absurdly close to the rates of sexual assaults in our community. Though the evidence suggests that these rates of sexual assault against female assigned at birth trans folks might be much higher than initially reported and closer to 50% reporting some of the forced sort of forced sexual acts not specifically described as sexual assaults. On top of those numbers, 22% and 15% of trans women and trans men, respectively, facing domestic and intimate partner violence as a direct result of anti-trans bias. And those numbers explode when we include things like sexual assaults and violence at the hands of authority figures like police officers, teachers, and bosses. So that's on top of the, the general domestic abuse numbers. The point of interest I have, however, is how the rates of violence faced by trans people generally and trans women specifically as it intersects with other marginalized communities. In the number provided by Injustice at Every Turn, we see how these numbers in regarding to IPV as a result of bias shifts, with Black, Latino, Asian, multiracial, trans people reporting at nearly twice the previous numbers, and nearly half of Native and First Nations folks reporting such violence. And that's as a direct result of anti-trans bias. So you include income and educational level, and as they intersect, the numbers kind of turn out exactly how you'd expect. So what's the point, right? Uh, well, they're, just, they're not just scary numbers. 
They work to tell us the pattern of violence in our community. And they tell us a story quite similar to the story we see with IPV across other communities. A, a trans Latina is far more likely than any other trans person to not have a high school diploma. Likely to make under $10,000 a year, more likely to have participated in underground economies, and we're usually talking about sex work there. And more as a result, if we pick out any random trans Latina, the chances that she's experienced extreme violence are obviously quite high because the chances that she carries with her are the extended risk factors. It's important to note that people with disabilities in the United States are significantly more likely to have bodies of color as well, specifically native and black. And disability, while incredibly wide-ranging, also brings with it a wide range of risk factors for domestic and IPV, with reported numbers ranging from 15 to 68, depending on disability. There's no specific risk factor, but it's important to recognize as a factor in complicating the risk for trans folks and people with bodies of color. So, because racism and anti-trans bias, as well as misogyny, have extremely broad economic and institutional and social effects, it stands to reason that such impact ripples out. All right, I promise I'm done with the numbers. Uh, but what I'd like us to understand is how these numbers mirror each other so well. From trans to cis. And the motivating factors involved in both are rooted in control and misogyny. Just like trans women, cis black women face disproportionate amount of such violence. And it turns out, at almost exactly the same rates we'd expect respectively. Remember that twice as likely number? I really don't want to spend too much time talking about how the other half lives, uh, but it's absolutely essential that we form context. I'm sure you social justice veterans are real bored in here, thinking, well, come on, Monica. Hello, this is just intersectionality, right? And yeah, you're right, you're right. In many ways, I've spent my time up until now explaining in detail why intersectionality matters especially when talking about violence. But I found that my words have so much more impact if I tell you why these things matter, rather than just telling you they did. So all of this comes back to the why. Why do black trans women carry the heaviest and most disproportionate consequences of violence in our community? Because domestic violence and intimate partner violence against women is a way of establishing dominance on both a personal level and a socio-political level. This should clarify why black women and black trans women in particular face such disproportionate violence, often resulting in death. Because white patriarchy establishes its dominance on both a political and personal level through the hands of its abusers. But that's it. That's all I can say on that specifically. Because frankly, at this point, I feel like I've come to that line that Bell Hooks described, where she said that even if perceived authorities writing about a group to which they do not belong and or over which they yield power are progressive, caring, and right on in every way, as long as their authority is constructed by absence of voices of individuals whose experiences they seek to address, the subject-object relationship is maintained and domination is reinforced. I'm not a black woman, obviously, and the most I can do is walk up to that line of why I need black women. Trans and cis side by side to be the authorities, to be the leaders, and to be the voices we cherish. We need black women for us. We need black women to change the world. Because on this factor in America, on this specific factor, without black trans women, we face, who face the greatest consequences of our, our failure as a movement. I, I'm not simply speaking about those women from the US on the list this year. I'm talking about all the black women. We fail day after day by exclusion or simply because we deem their voice unimportant. I say this as a multiracial trans Latina. I say this as a survivor of domestic and intimate partner violence. 
I say this as a survivor of what some would certainly describe as transphobic violence at knife point. I say this as a survivor of sexual assaults. I say this as a woman who cannot see her body in the mirror without seeing signposts reflecting back violence and abuse in the scars I wear. So what do I think all of this means? Intersection only matters. Black women matter. Black trans women matter. But more than that, intimate and domestic partner violence, as it intersects with transphobic violence, are the crossroads by which the cis white patriarchy makes its stand and exercises its domination and desire to subordinate and keep as a class all women, trans women, trans women of color, but particularly black trans women in the far reaches of society. Because all of us are to only exist at the pleasure of those who dominate. Whether that means our hypersexualization, coerced sexuality, all of it enforced at the hand of violence. But it isn't just intersectionality that matters. When we say that word, it's as good as a means of understanding that we must complicate the narratives from the singular focus of transphobia and the perverse pornographication and spectacle of the reading of the circumstances of murders of people we presume trans, that instead we think that about the ways that these roads don't just intersect, but the ways in which they interlock. My Latina self is inseparable from my trans self, and we are incapable of isolating those things from each other as we are incapable of isolating the circumstances of violence I've experienced from each other. All of me was the target, and all of me was the victim. To summarily describe violence that's been enforced on my body as racist or transphobic or misogynistic is to ignore all of the other parts of me. But we must instead see us, forgive me, holistically. As a whole people whatever that means. It means refusing to simply have a narrative, just the way we usually do, where people no longer have a voice, but fighting to complicate that narrative. Because to not do so means upholding those systems by which we oppress and continuing our complicit arming of that system. If we refuse to complicate the narrative, we are no longer innocent witnesses, but leveraged oppressors. I think more than anything, our way forward is by forging alliances. Forging alliances with those who fight against domestic violence, especially women and organizations of color. We have to take the charge that is our necessity. It is our debt, it is our rent for living on the planet Earth to fight for the lives of women who light up the lives, make living here worth it. Trans women of color are worth it. Black trans women are worth it. I hope that each of us makes a serious and somber effort to make the consequences of of the prevention of and the long-term post-care of domestic violence a priority. It's not just bathrooms and unemployment and dance parties. Our call is broader. Those things matter too, it's true. But we mustn't let, our, let ourselves forget the very real mortal consequences of leaving domestic violence, HIV, and the prison industrial complex away from our core priorities as a community. Instead of laying our focus on how to send more people, usually black men, to jail, instead of laying our investment in the state to graciously commit justice on our behalf, I believe we must focus our community efforts to broaden the support of victims, victims' families, and to prevent such violence through education, programs, and, control, and continuing discussion. Doing something about this violence, doing something about this violence that takes so fucking many of us. And it, and it has had its grip on so far many more. It's gonna require all of us. We must all remember yesterday, 
fight for the present and forge the future together. A future where none of us loses another sister who, who carried us when we couldn't carry ourselves. Remember trans women today, but remember us tomorrow and the next day and the day after. And never forget, fighting for trans justice is fighting for social justice. And just the same, fighting for economic justice, disability justice, and racial justice are fighting for trans justice. Reflecting on those whose lives were senselessly lost at the intersections of violence and injustice is one of the most important and sobering works we can do as a community. But it can't be all we do. Until we rise to the occasion, until each of us rises to action, until we meet the very real challenge of dismantling domestic violence, misogyny, racism, transphobia, ableism, until we do better, we'll keep meeting here each year, reading this ever-growing list of names of those who lost their lives at the intersections of violence and injustice. It's, it's true. The Trans Day of Remembrance is not what it should be. At least not yet. And being trans in this world, not what it should be. Not yet. That's it.